saving the environment. It happened because I had lived two decades in smoggy LA. You know, I imagine if someone grew up in war-torn Kosovo or Beirut, they might work towards the peace process. I grew up in, in smog-ridden LA. So after 20 years, two decades of it, 1970 went, that's it, I'm done. I mean, I wasn't totally done. I couldn't, you know, not use any fuel or electricity, but I did, I got an electric car in 1970. I started riding my bike, taking public transportation. I greatly, greatly, greatly reduced the amount of fuel that I was buying and using in my home. Well, home, I didn't have a home in 1970. I had an apartment, but I kept it, you know, at a very modest temperature all the time. And, but it came from living in smoggy LA. It came from also going down the Santa Monica Bay and seeing the horrible pollution there and seeing these sick fish and sick bivalves and lots of other, you know, creatures that were, uh, deformed from the pollution in the Santa Monica Bay and wanting to clean that up. And the people that heal the bay did just that. They cleaned the bay up to a large extent. Let me look at some of the other questions here. Do you think that was the reason wild diversity is happening? Yes. Yes, wild diversity is being assisted by planting native plants. Yes, I will answer that in the affirmative. What is the percentage of animal deaths caused by humans? Mrs. V, I'm not certain about that. That's a good question, but I know we can turn that around and be better stewards. And as people are doing by planting milk thistle and other uh, native plants that would uh, attract, you know, the monarch butterfly, for instance, that is working and it's working in many other areas where people are planting native plants and plants beneficial to diversity. Oh, very good question from Donna M. How do you feel about bee conservation? The bees are in big trouble, as you might know. Again, remove yourself for a moment, if you will, from being a lover of bees. I am a lover of bees, but take a moment away from that for our own benefit, for our own survival. Go to the supermarket and bring your smartphone with you if you have some or research it beforehand and look up how many different crops need pollinators to survive, to make their avocados, to make the citrus, to make the apples, to make the, all the different plants that we eat that's part of, our, of the bounty that we grow every year. They need pollinators. And, and our many species of bee are in colony collapse. There's colony collapse disorder from the neonicotoids and other uh, man-made substances that are damaging the bees. The bees, and it's not just the neonicotoids, the bees are dying from the death of a thousand cuts. There's so many things, the way they transport them around all the time. They're wonderful people conserving bees and making ap apiaries. I'm not trying to be critical of them, but it'd be much better if you just could let the bee population stay put as much as possible and care for them and cultivate them there and plant more diversity rather than just all apricot trees over many, many acres. That's a very efficient way to grow apricots or almonds or some of those things. But if you'd had <clears throat> apricots and then some native plants and then some, you know, other, some citrus and some, you had some diversity of species there and let the bees stay put, um, it would be much better for the bees, obviously, than being transported across country going over the Rocky Mountains in cold weather sometimes. And many of the bees die from, again, the neonicotoids, these chemicals, and from many other stresses upon them. So we have to preserve the bees for our own well-being. We love monarchs. I do too, Mrs. S. Mrs. V, see the movie, Re oh, thank you, Elgin H. See the movie Racing Extinction. I've seen it. It's unbelievable. There's a website here. Uh, HTTP, of course, colon, French slash, French slash, racingextinction.com, the film. So all you need to know, of course, is racingextinction.com, the film. It's an extraordinary movie. It's the most powerful environmental movie I've ever seen. And there are many powerful environmental movies, but this one is off the charts. What they've done with this movie, I've never seen anything like it. It's so moving. It's so important what they did, the way they went around the country with this slideshow projected on buildings and uh, to get people's attention, to make them consider what we're doing with the loss of species. It's the most powerful film on, I, I could just say this and be done with this whole 
wonderful webinar. I, I won't leave you, I promise, but see racing extinction. That's all you need to do to get motivated, to get activated. And I'm guessing that some of you have seen it. Um, those who have not seen it, racing, that's R-A-C-I-N-G, like racing, uh, you, know, you know, a bicycle race. I'll, I'll keep it away from the fossil fuel races. Racing extinction. And uh, it's extraordinary, very powerful. Buy a copy, get a copy, download it, whatever they allow you to do at racingextinction.com. Going to watch it today, says Donna M. Thank you. All of you who have not seen it, please watch it. It's wonderful beyond words. I, I was very moved by it. What's the difference between solar power and electricity? Uh, well, let me be very clear. Solar power is a way to generate electricity. What it does is it changes photons coming from the sun or coming from a, an incandescent source, even it will work, changing photons into electrons. And the panels today have like a 20 some odd percent conversion rate, which is very high. It used to be about 15 percent when I bought my first panels. Now it's somewhere in the 20s, I believe, of converting photons to electrons. There's an N surface and a P surface. That's a negative and positive surface of different elements. And the, different, the difference between those two elements generates electrons when photons hit it. And uh, so it's another way to generate electricity. Uh, other ways that have their costs, everything has a cost, of course. Having a wind turbine can damage wildlife, as we know. So you don't want to put them in areas where there's a lot of birds or bats or what have you. You got to be very careful with your site, wind turbines, and and uh, take steps to make sure that they're not running into. They put flashing lights and they put day glow things on the blades now and slow down the speed of the blades so they're not harming wildlife the way they used to. Uh, but things that really have a negative impact on the environment are fossil fuels, smokestacks kill a lot of birds too, um, and the, the risk to wildlife from continuing to burn fossil fuels with climate change is a, is a big, big number. Uh, so any way we can get off uh, fossil fuels to get off burning so much coal, using so much crude oil converted to diesel fuel and gasoline to move ourselves around, um, you can get electricity from the sun. I know for a fact you can, because I've been doing it since 1990. Here's the best thing about electric car. I'll tell you right now, very simply. The best thing about electric car is the following statement. You cannot make elect, I'm sorry. You cannot make gasoline on the roof of your house. You can make electrons on the roof of your house. I know I've been doing it for, boy, 1990 to now. Isn't that 26 years? I think it is. 26 years I've been making electricity on the roof of my house, and uh, it works. I know that it works. So uh, I would move away from fossil fuels, get solar if you can afford it. If you can't afford to buy it, they lease it to you now, and it's a very attractive program. And there's other ways, geothermal and other ways, to make electricity. I'm going to look at some more questions here. We just heard a talk on using PCP to control deer plots. We're very disturbed for the animals and humans as well. I would agree with that. How did you first start to develop the passion for the environment? Did it start at a young age? We are nine and 10 years old. That's a very good age to start, and that's when I started. I was a Boy Scout, and in scouting, they took us out to nature, and we'd camp out and experience nature up close and personal, and a lot of us were very drawn to it. It was the beginning of my, my love of nature was, uh, with scouting, and it's a passion that continues to this day. What can be done to prevent the use of PZP? Now, I don't know. I, I will admit my ignorance. I don't know a lot about that. I know they're trying to control the deer populations in ways with some chemicals, and I've heard vaguely about that, but I know very little about PZP, I'm sorry to say. Yes, my home of 26 years was run almost totally on solar. Um, my new home has 10 kilowatts of solar. I'm in a rental for another 12 days. Then I'll move into my new house that has 10 kilowatts of solar, which will be totally on solar. 
that'll be, I'll get a bill every month for zero because 10 kilowatts of solar is a lot of solar. Sorry for that glare into the camera there. Let me get back to the right screen. Um, but uh, yeah, 10 kilowatts is enough to run my house and charge my car. Let me see what else was asked here. What do you think is the best way to get people to really care about biodiversity and the environment? Do you have any suggestion how to get more people to care and help the cause? Yes, get involved with some of those groups I mentioned. I'm gonna mention some of them again. Give me a second. National Wildlife Federation, get involved with them. That's a great group. And NRDC is a good group. And locally, I'm sure you have groups wherever you live. We have tree people in Heal the Bay and groups like that. Northeast Trees and uh, LA Conservation Corps. We have some great people here in LA. Uh, Friends of the LA River, great people here in the LA area trying to do the right thing. Do you have any suggestion how to get more people to care about the cause? Get involved with those groups. So is the solar energy Oh, yes. The solar energy was stored in my house that I bought in 1988. I put solar in in 1990. Back in 1990, they did not have something called net metering, where you spin the meter back and forth. You spin it backwards during the day when you make power, you spin it forward at night. That didn't exist in 1990. So I had to have batteries. I had big batteries in the garage that were totally recycled when they were done with their use, and no toxic element was put in the landfill. But I had to have batteries because that's the only, only way to have power at night or on a cloudy day when you had solar in 1990 until maybe a decade later. Thirsty Society is doing great, great things for the pollinators and nas nationally too. That's X-E-R-C-E-S Society. X is in X-ray, E-R, C is in Charles, E-S is in Sam Society. Uh, check them out and work with them. What state causes the most pollution and why? I'm not certain which state causes the most pollution, but I can tell you who causes, who creates the least. Believe it or not, it's California. We started in the 70s making this state more energy efficient. They mandated it. They had very progressive thinking back in the 70s because many people like me were fed up with the smog. So people in Berkeley and San Francisco and the Bay Area started doing it. People in Southern California started doing it. They got in the state legislature and they mandated there had to be more efficient air conditioners and light bulbs and everything you can imagine. And though the rest of the country went like this from the 70s with their per capita energy use, California was like this from the 70s because of uh, uh, all the energy efficiency they put in to place and mandated legally that you must do that. So. Um, and they didn't stop there with just those laws created in the 70s and 80s. They continued to enact new laws, very vigorous and strong laws about climate change. So they're still being cutting edge, edge here in California. What do you say, uh, EHS2 says, what do you say to politicians and others that say that climate change is not happening or that it's going to happen regardless? Very good question. There's two there's two lies about climate change and really about the environment. One lie is nothing's wrong, everything's fine, back to your houses, folks, nothing to see. That's not correct. And I'll support this scientifically in a moment. The other one is it's too far gone, nothing we can do. Yes, it's happening, but you can't change it. Both are untrue. We said that about the smog in LA. We said about cleaning up Santa Monica Bay. The problems are too vast. You'll never clean up the smog in LA, LA or clean up Santa Monica Bay. And we did. Those are big, big problems. Not as big as climate change, I know, but they're huge and everybody thought they're insurmountable. The other one about it not happening, just go to any scientific resource you trust. For a second, I'm gonna say with all due respect to environmental groups, don't go to any environmental group to get your information about climate change. Bear with me, bear with me for a moment. Just go to NASA, NOAA, go to National Geographic, go to somebody you trust that really doesn't have a dog in the race. And they do not, they're just scientists and they will tell you the amount of CO2 is increasing, the temperature of the planet is increasing, the amount of sea ice is diminishing, the sea level is rising, 
These are all facts. You can be angry about them. You can be indifferent about them. You can be happy about them. You can ignore them, but they're happening nonetheless. And people with PhD after the name who study such things will all tell you this. There's precious few people who deny it. Now on to the thing about it's too far gone. I want to address that right now because there are some things, and this is a bold statement, I suppose, for some, but it happens to be true. There are some things in the pipeline with CO2 we cannot change. I don't know if we're going to save a lot of coastal Bangladesh. I don't know about that. I don't think we can. I don't think we can save the Marshall Islands. I think there's large areas in South Florida that we cannot save. But do we want to save the rest of Florida? Do we want to save the rest of Bangladesh? Lower Manhattan is going to have severe challenges with flooding in the coming years. I don't know what to do about that. But do you want to save Midtown? Let's, let's do what we can today to save what remains. We're going to get severe impacts from climate change. That is true. The people that are doomed, doomsday, nothing to be done, are somewhat correct about that. Some things in the pipeline cannot be changed with the feedback loops from methane being released from you know, the tundra and what have you, from the permafrost, that's called a feedback loop. And the more things heat up, the more methane gets released and the more things heat up. And so there's no way to put that genie back in the bottle, but we can do we can to stop putting more CO2 in the environment, more methane in the environment and try to save Midtown and what remains of Bangladesh, what remains of other island nations that may not be as in, 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 may not be in such big trouble as the Marshall Islands. So do what you can to save what you can today. Have you ever considered running for public? No, God help us. No more actors in the White House or anywhere. Um, <laughs> not anywhere. Actors are entitled to do whatever they want. They're citizens too. But this actor, I don't want to run for public office. I feel I can be more effective from the outside in an advisory capacity doing what I'm doing today. But um, yes, I, I'm very happy with what I'm doing to work occasionally as an actor, still work somewhat consistently as an actor, actually, and to be a, a full time environmentalist with every waking minute I have when I'm not working. Um, that causes me, uh, uh, it creates a great deal of uh, peace and joy and serenity in my life, knowing I'm doing everything I can every day so that the world has something like what I remember as a child, some level of diversity and, uh, and survival capability for our species, among others. So no public office for me. Anybody else have a question, a query, a statement about anything I've said or don't say? We have about eight minutes left. I just wanted to make sure I get everybody answered. Great questions, by the way, great statements. I want to talk about, I'm going to get to all the questions. I want to take just a second and talk about return on investment, ROI, and payback time. What By payback, I mean... Uh, when you get a payback for putting up something like solar or building a more energy efficient home, people look at that, they go, it doesn't pencil out, man. The ROI, the return on investment isn't any good. You know, what's the cost of building your home? Uh, well, the cost of a home is the cost it takes for all the construction costs, the labor and the materials. That's the cost of a home. That's like looking at an iceberg and saying, look at that little wedge above the waterline. That's not a big iceberg. That's nothing at all. There's a huge piece of that iceberg below the waterline in many cases, and that is a cost, the real cost of a home. The cost of building it is that little tiny wedge above the waterline. The huge piece is below the waterline. What is that? The cost of running the home. That's what you need to consider. Over the hundreds of years the home that you build might last, you want to look at the cost of running that home. And if you look at that, the return on investment is extraordinary, and you want to build with the greenest materials you can and go for lead silver, gold, or platinum. I just built a lead platinum home, and you're going to hear a lot more about that soon. How do you measure how much solar energy you get every day? There's a meter that uh, on the inverters, on the two electronic devices that convert the DC power from the solar panels to AC power, usable power. There's a readout there that you can watch. Many people also put a meter. It's kind of a reverse meter that shows you how much electricity you're generating. In fact, you have now that I think of it, in LA, you have to have that 
so the DWP can see how much power you're generating. And that's how it's measured with a meter that works kind of in reverse. Our local university is running a great series of ecology seminars free to the public, maybe a great resource to look into in each community. That's great, ecology seminars free to the public. That is a good thing to do for local universities to do such things. And uh, I don't know who would make that happen, the local uh, green club at a college university or perhaps the faculty, the dean and others, uh, the science teachers have an interest in such things. They usually do many of the um, college campuses I've been to, people uh, in the science departments usually have a, a belly for such things and they want to they want to have uh, you know sustainable practices and they want to have sustainable seminars and what have you to teach people how to do it themselves. You know, there's several ways to look at wealth. Some people feel that wealth is a number in a bank account, a number in a piece of paper, that's wealth. But for me, re real wealth, it's not necessarily having a lot of money. I have nothing against money. I, I, I feel comfortable if I have a few dollars in the bank, but I think what is every bit as good as having a lot of money is the following, not needing a lot of money. Not needing a lot of money is really every bit as good as having a lot of money. The results are the same. If you make yourself a house that has very low energy bills and you're able to afford or lease solar and you have a very low or non-existent electric bill, you drive around your car that's charged on that same thing, your monthly bills are going to be very, very low. You don't need a lot of money. And that is a form of wealth. You can behave the same way that rich people do. They take vacations or do things or take time off, work part time, work not at all, retire. You can do all those things because you don't need a lot of money. And that's every bit as good as being wealthy by having a big number on a bank account somewhere, in my humble opinion. But keep in mind, as much as I'm celebrating and promoting, and I am, things like electric cars and solar panels, they are, after all, just things. And you don't want to get too hung up on things of any kind. I, I, again, I have solar panels. I have an electric car. I'm not adverse to things. I'm not prepared with the way I was raised to live somewhere in the wild, you know, uh, living totally off the land and, uh, and not having any of any possessions whatsoever. I'm, I'm not a survivalist. I'm not able to do that. But I try not to put too much emphasis on things because if things made you happy, there'd be nothing but happy people in Bel Air and unhappy people out in the bush. And that's not the case. There's a lot of joy and happiness in people and native people throughout the world who have very little in the way of possessions. So we all have stuff. I certainly do. Everybody I know does. Even native peoples have things that they cherish and collect and celebrate. But the less emphasis we have on stuff, I think, is the greatest road to happiness. Don't get too hung up on stuff, no matter how benign. What do you believe is the best part of saving the earth? The, um, the joy that I get from knowing I did my part. The joy I get from knowing we have our successes, we have our challenges and failures and difficulties when you see the plastic in the ocean and climate change and ocean acidification and overfishing. That causes me concern, of course, but then you look at the many Good news story is the Cuyahoga River caught fire in 1969. There was so much pollution on it. The rivers were so polluted in America, we had rivers catching fire. L.A. was so smoggy, you couldn't even sit outside. Forget about running. You would hurt your lungs just to sit in, on a bench outside. Santa Monica Bay was so polluted, you couldn't eat any of the fish. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't worry about that. But a lot of people eat fish, and it was a cause of concern. That's turned around now. Those are big things that we did. So we can do this. We can't change everything. We can't turn everything around, but we can turn a lot around and we need to set about doing it today. Donna M, excellent wisdom. That's very sweet of you to say, Donna. So we've got like three minutes left. If anybody has a last statement or question or anything, I've really enjoyed talking to you all. Please forgive me for grandpa having technical difficulty here at the beginning. I didn't fully understand uh how things were working here i thought i was going to hear 
questions to you through my headset uh, vocally. I didn't know I was just gonna, gonna get them on the screen. I'm sorry about that, but I've enjoyed my time with you. We really appreciate you talking to us. You're inspiring the next generation. Well, you're inspiring me, Mrs. S. Thank you. Thank you for helping us. Why do you believe biodiversity is important? It's so important. I believe it's important because we need it to survive. We couldn't get by without the pollinators. We couldn't get by without all the microbes in the soil. We need it to grow food and to live. We need it to, you know, we need trees to make oxygen so we can survive. Thank you so much for all the information. Really enjoyed listening to you. Ideas we can take home. You're wonderful. We appreciate your time uh, and insight. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, go out there and spread the word. Go out there and do what you can. It's going to be good for your bottom line. You're going to save money by doing all the cheap and easy stuff first. You're going to profit right away by doing the cheap and easy stuff right away. Like I said, energy saving thermostat, weather stripping, bike riding, if weather and fitness permit, public transportation, energy efficient light bulbs, save money, protect the environment, cherish diversity for your own well-being, for your own survival. I'm grateful to be here and thank you so much for having me. Ed Begley signing off.